Thanks for the introduction and the, and the invite. It's very, been very nice to, to visit with people today. And uh, we had a great dinner last night talking about water bottles. So, and the importance for the, for the new generation of, like our kids love water bottles. Uh, and that apparently is unique, is, is, is conserved across children. So that, that was exciting. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the stuff that my lab has been doing. I'm actually going to talk uh, quite a bit about this concept of T-cell differentiation and CD8 T-cell differentiation. Uh, and um, so how we're trying to approach that in terms of, in terms of using genetically engineered mouse models. Uh, a lot of the work I'll talk about will be in, in the context of an acute viral infection with LCMV. Uh, but uh, I'll talk about where we're trying to go and, and how we think that this process works. Uh, so in the lab, we're really interested in combining two things. We take a fairly developmental biology approach to trying to understand um, <coughs> how T cells work uh, and trying to understand how they differentiate in the context of different responses, different tissues, different challenges. And to understand that, we, we try and bring in engineering of animal models to, to diversify the number of different situations where we can study uh, T cell responses. And as I mentioned, today I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about our published work uh, on, on CD8 T cells in, in their differentiation in cancer. And that's mostly to set up what I'll talk about from the majority of the talk, which is an unpublished uh, set of work that we're using a technique called PerturbSeq uh, to knock out transcription factors in CD8 T cells and understand how this affects trajectories of differentiation, uh, function of those cells, and then uh, a surprise of, of how that also affects uh, whether a cell becomes exhausted. So the way we think about this, and, and this, uh, this concept is pretty, pretty basic, is that CD8 T cells and, and CD4 T cells, and, and probably a lot of cells, uh, have the potential to differentiate in the context of an immune response into a number of different uh, effector cell states. You can get some cell that retains memory potential and can become a memory cell, a central memory cell, effector memory. There are some cells that might become exhausted and, and have low function, uh, but can be resilient to antigen challenge. Uh, you might have a cell that, that retains the potential to generate other cell types, like a stem-like cell, uh, and can continue to, to output effector cells or, or exhausted cells. You may have some cells that are very poor, poor responders in the, in, the, in the response. I just realized that my titles are actually above the, the cells. Uh, you might have cells that are, that, are, that are effector cells, that are shorter lived, uh, but a terminal fate, and then some cells might become energic or might die. And so the question is what controls this? One cell can become all of these fates. Uh, and we know that these are signals that the T cell sees uh, within the context of the responses that are uh, affecting which of these cell fate decisions uh, these cells will, 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 in, will uh, take on. So the way we've been thinking about this, uh, just how to, how to relate all the different cell subsets, is this idea that there are a number of cardinal features that the CD8 T cells especially can have. They can be long-lived, they could have self-renewal, they could have proliferative potential, resilience to, to, to repeated antigen challenge, cytolytic function, uh, ability to home or stay within a tissue, and then cytokine production. Uh, and we think about T cell subsets as really being mix and matches of these different, these different features. So a central memory cell might be one with longevity and self-renewal and high proliferative potential, but also one that's not very resilient to being rechallenged with antigen over and over again. Whereas a cell that's more of an exhausted cell may have some cytolytic function and resilience, but maybe very poor responder in terms of proliferative capacity to repeat a challenge. And so within these subsets, we think is actually just different programs and that these are all going to be related in some way uh, in terms of a developmental process where cells are making decisions about which functions they keep and which ones they turn off. And so we're trying to understand how this process works. Uh, and I think we won't really talk so much about the signals today, but uh, the, the lab is designed to mostly uh, capture the states and then try to understand how they're, how they're related. Uh, going back to what I, what I started working on as a grad student, and, and this will be relevant for, for the talk today, we were quite interested in how you make a memory T cell. And the idea was that a naive T cell would give rise to a, a heterogeneous pool of effector cells. Some of those would be very terminally differentiated and shorter lived. Some cells would retain prolifer proliferative potential, memory potential. They would be functional. And these cells would, would go on to form preferentially memory T cells. Uh, we and others have described a number of transcription factors that are associated with either the, the, the memory state or the memory precursor state or the, the terminal effector state. Uh, and and that, uh, con the, the role of these transcription factors has been 
fairly well described for a number of these different uh, states within, the, within this differentiation, but also with uh, other differentiations that T cells will go, uh, CDA T cells will undergo, such as TRMs, uh, forming exhausted cells, et cetera. Uh, and we also can think about this as like a, a Waddington plot, where you have these naive T cells, which start off with, with lots of potential. But as they're differentiating down the, the trajectory of differentiation, they're trading off uh, uh, proliferative capacity, uh, 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 memory potential for increased function and also sh shorter lifespans. And so the signals that tend to drive this in the context of an acute infection are inflammation. But we do retain some cells with, with, with less differentiated states that are stable that can go on to make memory. In the context of chronic infection, we can now see how that the, I the idea is that antigen and other signals associated with the chronic infection can drive a more, uh, more differentiated state that generates something we think of as a, a stem-like cell. I'll also call it a precursor exhausted cell. The field has been sort of toying with both names. Uh, this is a cell that has the potential to still respond to PD-1 therapy and give rise to effector cells, but also in the steady state will we'll generally generate cells that are, are low functional. So we think of those as exhausted. And so we're quite interested in, in understanding how this framework, which was described in first in viral infection, is now applying to other different, different challenges. And in the context of cancer, this has also now become the dominant model, this idea that you have these precursor exhausted cells and that these cells are the cells that give rise to potentially effector cells or exhausted cells. And even this idea that there's a spatial differentiation and that the, the precursor exhausted cells might reside in a lymphoid tissue and that over time those cells would migrate to the tumor and become exhausted within the tumor. And the idea about therapy might be that you could either try and fix the cells in the tumor or you could try and fix the cells that are coming to the tumor and improve their function and thereby uh, drive effector uh, clearance of, of the tumors. So the questions that we've been asking is how are these CD8 T cell populations maintained? I'll show you uh, some data from a, from a study that we published a number of years ago on the idea that the, the tumor draining lymph node is the reservoir of these cells. Uh, we're also interested in, in what are the factors that are controlling this terminal exhaustion. And, and really, we're thinking in this case about transcription factors and, and why cells make these decisions. And the last question is, if we modulate those transcription factors, can we, pre can we prevent exhaustion? So that's a starting point for, for thinking about therapies that might, might mimic what the transcription factors would do. So what do we, we, we bring to the table that's a little different? Well, we're quite interested in studying these processes in cancer. And specifically, we're interested in studying these in models of genetically engineered mouse models. And so the genetically engineered mouse models of cancer are a little bit different than what most people traditionally think of as cancer models. In traditional cancer models, you tend to take cell lines that were grown, uh, and most of them were isolated in the 1950s. I often think about these as the oldest thing that actually exists within uh, in your lab if you're using cell lines. Uh, and you take these cell lines, you transplant them into a syngenetic recipient. Uh, they elicit a little bit of an immune response, but that immune response is not enough that they won't grow. And that allows you to then ask, how do we make that response better through therapy? And this is a very standard way that people study how to improve therapies. It's a fantastic setting for trying to understand how to, how to, how to make a better T cell response that's more functional. But in terms of understanding T cell biology and why the T cells are messed up, we think that these genetically, model, genetically engineered models are a little bit better for this. These are tumor models where you initiate tumors within the mouse. You take a normal cell, you turn on an oncogene, you may remove a tumor suppressor, and these cells will now, uh, those individual cells will now develop through all of the stages of, of, of transformation and become premalignant and then become cancer. And these cells can even become metastatic over time. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is a KRAS P53 mouse, where it has an oncogenic form of KRAS downstream of a lock stop locks element, and it also has two, two flox copies of the tumor suppressor P53. When you administer CRE to this mouse, in this case through an inhaled lentivirus, uh, what you do is you, you uh, in, uh, cause recombinations in single lung epithelial cells that activates KRAS, removes P53, and these single transformed cells will now develop over the course of several months through many different stages into something that becomes an invasive tumor uh, that can even become metastatic. So this is great. It allows us to study how tumors develop. It allows us to understand how different genetic alterations that we program into the tumors affect that development. It also allows us to understand how different environmental factors shape the trajectory of tumor differentiation or development. And include, that includes cells of the immune system. And so one of the things that we noted very early on was that if we don't put T cell neoantigens into these tumors, the tumor microenvironment is relatively cold. It doesn't have 
T cells, there's no B cells, there's, there's no lymphoid cells in the tumors. But if we put in a simple neoantigen, in this case uh, a novalbumin peptide, uh, now you get a bunch of CD8 T cells and, CD, and B cells and uh, CD4 T cells that are infiltrating the tumor. So you can turn a, a cold tumor hot, and this allows us to study uh, what it is that those, those CD8 T cells and, and CD4 T cells are doing. So one of the mechanisms that we described for how to put the neoantigens into the tumors was this mouse we call Ninja. And the idea here was we were very interested in trying to make the antigen that the tumor would express something that would come from the genome. And there's a lot of reasons to do that. Uh, but the main question we had was, was it possible when we started making this mouse? And the idea was a number of people had tried to put antigens into the genome, inducible antigens. And the way they had done it was to put an antigen downstream of a lock stop locks element or a, a tet inducible promoter. And oftentimes that would work. You could turn on the antigen in the periphery and you could, you could see that the cells were expressing the antigen. But if you look for the T cell responses, there wouldn't be very much of a response. And that was because there was a little leakiness within the thymus. Uh, those T cells that would go through the thymus would see that antigen and there would be deletion of the, the T cells. So we decided we need to make an antigen which didn't exist until you turned it on in the periphery. And the way we did that was we used a, a uh, construct that has two modules. There's a neoantigen which controls the, the, um, the antigen that uh, is going to be made. That's the creation part. And this is the, the regulatory module. And I'll explain exactly how that works, but it's, it encodes this recombinase flippo under several different levels of regulation, so that can cause the critical re recombination within the regulatory module. And the way this works as follows, we, we took two peptides, model antigen peptides from LCMV, GP33 and GP66, and in the DNA that encodes these antigens, we introduce these splice sites to create this central exon. In, the, in, in order to now make it so that that couldn't be expressed, we inverted this central exon so that in the off state, you would skip those, those uh, uh, epitope encoding peptides, uh, DNA sequences, and you couldn't, couldn't make them. And now to turn this on, we need to flip this thing over. So we added two non-compatible FRIT sites, which are responsive to this recombinase FLIPO. So when we introduce FLIPO into the cells, this causes a permanent inversion. Now the splice sites line up, and now you can make the antigen which you're interested in studying. We call this the inversion-induced joint neoantigen, or, nin or NINJA. And NINJA has another nice feature of being buried within a GFP molecule, so that when you turn on the, an when the antigen is off, this splices out of frame, it causes a, an out of frame stop, and so you get half of a GFP. Now when you, when you give FLIPO, this fixes, this corrects the, the reading frame, you get the full length protein, and it's also GFP positive. So you can tell which cells are antigen positive. And now we have this other half, which is how we control that FLIPO. And for, this gets a little into the weeds, but the idea is you have three different levels of regulation. You have cre recombinase, which is required to cause a recombination, similar to what, what, was in, what would happen here. Uh, and also you have to give doxycycline and tamoxifen to, to actually act, give the, the full FLIPO activity. So this works as follows. We can give cre recombinase and poise this allele. Uh, and then when we give doxycycline and tamoxifen, that'll activate the FLIPO. And that now allows us to, to, to study the, the antigen expressing cells, which were the ones that saw cre earlier. And we studied this in two different contexts. We have used this to make a number of peripheral tolerance models by crossing these mice to mice that have tissue-specific crees. So we can turn on antigen in any tissue that we have a cre for and ask, what happens to the CD8 T cells that, and CD4 T cells that are specific for those, those, um, those antigens? And I won't talk about that, but we have a couple papers on that uh, out uh, in the literature. We also have crossed this to uh, the KRAS P53 model, where we can initiate tumors with CRE, causes the recombinations in KRAS and removes P53, and then at some later time we can give uh, doxycycline and tamoxifen, and that turns on antigens just in those developing tumors. And that allows us to study T cell responses against the developing tumor. And so uh, just the things that the lab is working on, we are interested in, and I'll talk about some of these details, of what happens to CD8 T cell responses in cancer. We're also interested in uh, something that we observed in these cancer models, which is the formation of tumor-associated tertiary lymphoid structures. And that's something that the lab is quite actively studying, something we're quite interested in. And it's a, a nice parallel with something that happens in patients, uh, but other models didn't really have this. So it's a nice feature that we're trying to understand more about the biology of these structures. We're also interested in understanding why T cells could restrict the growth of an antigen expressing tumors. In the lung model I showed you, the tumors come out, they're expressing neoantigens. If we just change the location of the, of the tumor, initiate a tumor in the muscle, 
causes soft tissue sarcoma, now you never get an antigen expressing tumor. Same antigen, same oncogene, <coughs> same mouse, just different location. So it turns out that the location of the antigen is really important and the, and the tumor is really important for dictating the outcome and we're trying to understand how that works. Um, the other thing that we're interested in, as I mentioned, is the, interest, uh, the, uh, the impact of different tissue types on peripheral tolerance. Uh, we just recently had a paper on how T cells in the skin will get activated. If you turn on the engine in the skin, they'll get activated, they'll look like effector cells, but they'll get trapped in the dermis, so they don't really cause pathology. Turns out if you turn on the engine in the liver, you get a completely different phenotype. You get energic cells within a few days that won't respond to infection with LCMV. If you turn on the antigen in the colon, T cells go and attack the colon, uh, the cells in the colon uh, very, very rapidly. If you turn on the antigen in the pancreas, you get, you get T cells that go into the pancreas but can't attack the beta cells. So every tissue, it turns out, has a slightly different mechanism for maintaining peripheral tolerance, and we're quite interested in using these models to start to de-orphanize that. And finally, the thing which I'm going to talk about most today, which is in, uh, this idea of using genetic models and, 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 and LCMV to try and understand the, the, the mechanisms of effector C8 T cell differentiation and how they differ between different types of challenges. So the question that we started out asking was, we, we knew that there was this idea that there were less differentiated CD8 T cell populations that would give rise to more, effective, more, more terminally differentiated cells within the tumor, and that these cells could be exhausted or they could be effectors. But if you think about it, these terminal fates are all tied to the presence of antigen and, and seeing antigen. And, and we know that these stem-like CD8 T cells are those cells that, the precursor exhausted cells, the cells that seem to be the ones that are important for, for therapeutic responses to anti-PD-1. We know these cells should be in a patient when the patient walks into the, into the clinic and, and, and gets the therapy, right? Because otherwise the therapy wouldn't work. But there's a problem here. Tumors take months or years to develop in the patient, and all that time there's antigen that these T cells should be sitting around. And so we had this question, how is it possible that you maintain a stem-like population within an antigen-rich environment uh, and, and are able to still have those stem-like cells uh, at the time of treatment? And I have to say, we actually kind of thought this wouldn't work. We thought that actually these cells would be gone and that the answer would be that you were somehow initiating different responses against different antigens. But it turned out initially that when we started to look after months of tumor development that we could actually still find these stem-like cells within the tumor. And so we started to ask where was it that they were, that they were coming from. So the way we asked this question, and this is a published paper, but I just want to highlight this one piece of data, is that the way we asked this was we would initiate tumors in these mice, we would turn on antigens, and then we would take the mice at, day, at week 8 or week 16 plus, and we would sort out the antigen-specific CD8 T cells from the lymph node and the, tumor, and, and the, and the, and the lung tumors. Uh, we would do this using uh, MHC class 1 tetramers and look for endogenous CD8 T cells. We would then run single cell RNA-seq and paired TCR-seq, so that allowed us to understand the clonality of the T cells uh, in, in these different locations. And we also, as, a, as, an, as an aside, we used the, the, the clone 13 model at, at day 21, which is a nice model when there's, there's exhausted cells, there's precursor cells, so we could have something to compare them to. And when we did this, uh, again, I'm skipping a lot of the data, but I just want to point out this, this comparison. When we did this, we were able to line up where the, the exhausted cells and the, and the precursor cells were uh, on, a, on a map. And we're using a technique called FATE. This is kind of like a UMAP, but our collaborators really love this technique because they made it. Uh, and so uh, you can think of it a lot like a UMAP where you have cells that are precursor exhausted cells, and I'm not showing you the markers that would indicate that they're precursor exhausted, but the, the precursor exhausted cells are over here, and the, the more terminally differentiated cells are over here in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, on this side where this blue dot is. And when you look at where the cells are coming from, you see that the cells within the draining lymph node, and these are all sorted tumor-specific cells, they're all in the, in, the t in the precursor exhausted, less differentiated states. And when they go into the tumor now, they, they, they become more terminally differentiated and they upregulate markers of terminal differentiation and become exhausted. And there's this nice transition between, between the two sites. And we know these are the same cells because we went back and we looked at the clonality and we could show that the same clones were present in this population in the lymph node and this population in the tumor. Just using pseudo time, we were able to actually line up the differentiation uh, along a single metric and we were able to show that the T cells in the lymph node were less differentiated and the ones within the tumor were more differentiated. 
And so this just in indicated that these cells within the lymph node were the, were the, were the precursor cells that were, were, were maintained. And because this was week 17 and we had week 8, we actually showed that the cells from week 8 and week 17 in the lymph node were quite similar. Really, transcriptionally, they're almost identical. So we think that these cells are very stable within the lymph node. When we block migration, we lose this population of stem-like cells in the tumor. So we think that they're migrating from the lymph node to the tumor, and that's how this is maintained. The other point I wanted to make here is this idea that we could actually, com by comparison to LCMV, we could, we could look for where are these different subsets. And so, uh, and I apologize, I started calling these stem-like cells, but now I'm going to call them TPEX because that seems to be the, the nomenclature. It's like uh, back in the day when you had Betamax and, and, uh, and VHS and everybody, VHS won out. TPEX seems to be the winner. Uh, so we'll call them TPEX from this point on. Uh, but my brain still wants to call them stem-like, so I apologize if I switch. Uh, but the idea was that if you looked in chronic infection, you could define these cells based on a number of markers on this heat map, uh, and that these cells were preferentially enriched in the early lymph node and the late lymph node, but weren't really present in the tumor. If we looked at these cells down here that have more of an exhausted signature, again, they're present in the, in the, in the chronic infection, and those cells are mostly in the late tumor and the, and the early tumor. So within the tumor, we're enriching for those cells. But there was another population here, which is more of the effector cells. These are the cells that we think should be doing the killing. And these cells we couldn't really find in the tumor model. They were mostly coming from the chronic infection. That was something that we found very curious. We thought, and what it made us think was maybe our models are really good at driving uh, exhaustion, but maybe not so good at driving effector responses. And I'll come back to that in a second. So the model, again, was that this, there would be these uh, precursor exhausted cells. They would, they would hang out within the lymph node, uh, that this would be a stable reservoir where these cells could be protected from uh, chronic antigen stem, and that over time, some fraction of these cells would migrate from the draining lymph node to the tumor, uh, and where they would see high signals antigen, uh, and then they would, they would differentiate into uh, exhausted cells. So another group a year later took some of our data and actually did a better job of analyzing it, which is why I'd like to show their, their, their results. Uh, but the idea that they came up with, which was quite, clear, quite interesting, was if you look at those cells within the tumor draining lymph node, there are some that are even, even more or less differentiated there. And they started to look for this cell that's uh, marked by expression of uh, CD62L or CCR7. And they've, this has started to be called now the TPEX1 cell. This would be the, the most the least differentiated cell with the highest proliferative potential, highest memory potential. And they showed these cells, if you sort them out of tumor draining lymph nodes, that these cells would, would become uh, memory cells, that they would, they would function like memory, they would respond to, to uh, uh, therapeutics, and that they would uh, be able to clear infections and tumors much better than the cells that are further down this list. So what I like about it is that they had taken some of our data and actually showed that some of these were in this TPEX one state, so we are maintaining some fraction of our cells in that. But the most of the cells are actually in this TPEX2 state, which is the next step down. And that'll come up again in the, in the talk, uh, that these cells seem to be uh, a little bit more differentiated uh, down, the, down, the, down the pathway. So now the idea was you have these TPEX1 cells and TPEX2 cells. You can start to subset the, the, the precursor cells, and that maybe these cells here would be the, would be the better cells for maintaining memory responses and also for, for, for responding to PD-1. What we were interested in by this point was trying to understand why it was that we weren't getting more of these, uh, these functional uh, effector cells in our models. And we kind of had this idea that uh, maybe this was due to the absence of CD4 help. And we realized that our, our models had uh, antigens for, for T cells, they had both antigens for CD4 and CD8 T cells, uh, but that the CD4 T cells, we could get rid of those CD4 T cells, and there wasn't really much of an effect on the growth of the tumors. We decided around this time, working with Joe Kraft's lab, to, to ask a question about T follicular helper T cells and whether or not you could drive TFH responses just by putting B cell antigens into the tumors. And the idea was we put a, an engine that we call HELLO, which is a fusion of HEL and a lysozyme to those LCMV antigens. That was very effective at driving a sp tumor specific B cell response. And those tumor specific B cells would now very nicely drive the tumor specific CD4 T cells towards a TFH fate. But what was really surprising to us was that these cells 
through their production of, of IL-21 would actually help the, the CD8 T cells in the tumors. And now we would get these effector CD8 T cells uh, within the tumor microenvironment. So we think in addition to the role that, that TFH cells play in helping B cells, that they may have another role in terms of their production of IL-21 in helping CD8 T cells within tumor microenvironments to, to make this switch uh, from, a, from a precursor exhausted cell to, a, to, a grand, to an effector cell. And that, that seems to be similar to work that's been done now in viral infection that has kind of confu uh, confirmed this same idea uh, that IL-21 from TFH cells seems to be driving effector CD8 T cell responses in, in, in infection models as well. Okay, so I've now I've set up a few different ideas. This idea that there are these differentiation processes, that the differentiation processes and how cells make these decisions is important for thinking about uh, how, uh, how T cell responses happen in cancer. The next thing I want to talk about, uh, and what I'll talk about for the bulk of the time, is, is now what do we do with this? How do we start to ask more mechanistic questions about what's happening? And so one of the things that I've been interested in for a very long time is this idea of trying to understand if we could make a big map of where all the T cells are going in, in, in many different types of challenges. So you might think about this as the map I just showed you for, say, a day eight tumor and lymph node is like Alabama here. I think that's Alabama. Uh, and, and, and our responses in, in, in LCMV are like uh, one of these square states down here. And, and we're thinking about, could we put them all together and make one giant map of where all the T cells could possibly go in the context of all the different challenges that they might see? The idea here is if we, if we now start to take CD8 T cells across many different types of responses, we could start to line them up on a map. Uh, and because uh, I start this as a naive T cell starting out in, in, in St. Louis, which is where, which is where I'm from, uh, so we started there. And, and the idea was that in an infection, these cells might, might be driven more towards going to Boston, uh, and, and they might get terminally differentiated. But some of the less differentiated cells might end up wherever this is. Uh, and, and so that might be where memory cells go. Uh, on the flip side, for cancer, we might be generating cells that go to, to San Diego, sorry. Uh, but, then, uh, but then if you were to, the, the goal may be actually through therapy to drive them up here to Seattle and try and improve the function of those cells. And of course, my lab always laughs because I put tolerance in, in, in uh, Florida. So there's two questions here that we're quite interested in. One is, what are the roads that the cells follow in, 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 in order to make the differentiations, the, uh, the, the, the appropriate differentiation that they, that they do? And, the, and what are the signals that push them one way or another. But the other question that's inherent in this is why don't cells in, say, an acute infection, why don't they become more like cells in a chronic infection? What are the signals that, what are the guardrails that keep them from, from going the wrong way? So the way we've been doing this, we, we developed the engineered mouse models, recapitulate a lot of conditions. We've been generating the map uh, using single cell RNA seq data from sorted antigen specific T cells across a bunch of different models. And today I'll mostly focus on, uh, on LCMV infection. Uh, and then we're using this technique called perturbsy to knock out transcription factors within the T cells and ask, how does this change differentiation trajectories? And so the way that we started out doing this was we started with the making of the map. And it turns out the making of the map was, was very helpful for our interpretation of the perturbsy data. We wanted to ask a question of whether or not we could capture the most number of differentiation states that CD8 T cells could, could be in within the context of an LCMV infection in the spleen. And we focused mostly on the spleen just for, for, for technical reasons. We took mice with LCMV Armstrong infection or clone 13 infection uh, day 4, day 8, day 28, and day 40. So we're, we're covering a large swath of the, the different states that the cells could be in. And we sorted out the antigen-specific T cells uh, from, these, from these states. These are endogenous cells. And then we did uh, single-cell RNA-seq and TCR-seq. And we put these together into one giant UMAP to try and understand where all the states were relative to each other. And this is what this looked like. We, we made a 3D U map because two dimensions just weren't enough. Uh, and so this is where all the T cells from all those eight time points sit. We have some cells that are over here that look more like progenitor cells uh, that, are, that are less differentiated. We have some cells on this axis, on this, on this side, that are more of the terminal cells. So we have our short-lived effector cells. We have ter uh, like effector memory. And if we go up in this dimension up here, we get cells that are in exhaustion. So now we get the exhausted cells up here. These are the terminal exhausted cells that you see in chronic infection. Down here are the, uh, the cells that are, that are still effector cells, but they're present in exhausted cell, in exhaustion. And then we get these cells over here that are the, the memory precursor cells that ultimately turn into the memory cells. 
And then over here, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that we have a, a, a cell that we think is the, the precursor exhausted cell, this stable population that we think gives rise to this uh, exhausted cell or this effector cell. And I'll show you some of the data for that. And I should point out, we're quite informed by this, uh, on this map. This is not something that we're doing for the first time. We're, we're just making our own map. But this is mirrors data that, that John Weary and uh, Ansu Sadpathy have, have, have generated uh, on chronic infection and, and acute infection as well. So we're not uh, rewriting the, the script here at all. We're just, we're just trying to make our own map. And I'll explain why in a second. So the next question we asked was just, if we use pseudotime analysis, can we describe how the cells move through this map? And we can see that the progenitor cells are over here, and we started that as the start. You get cells over here that are more of the short-lived effector cells, and we think those are the most differentiated cells. And then you have these cells that are, that are, arm, that are memory precursor or memory cells that are kind of in the middle. And when we line this up uh, by, by, by real time now, we can go back and ask, does this match with our expectations? And indeed it does. Early on in the response, you have cells that are less differentiated. This peaks around day eight of infection, so now you get the most differentiated cells. And then over time, you have preferential survival of cells that are a little less differentiated that will become the memory cell populations. So that fit with our expectations. What about chronic infection? In chronic infection, we think there's a bifurcated di uh, di uh, a split within the, within the populations, where after this TPEX cell, some cells will go over to become exhausted cells, and some cells will go on to become these effector cells that are present within, within chronic infection. And indeed, when we line up the, the, um, the, the, the populations, we see that uh, now by real time, by, by in terms of the, the real actual time, you see earlier on in infection, you have less differentiated cells, but over time, you actually accumulate more and more differentiated cells in line with the fact that the antigen is persisting all, all throughout this response. Okay, so now we have our map and now we can ask the question of what regulates these fate decisions. And so for this, we, we focus mostly on transcription factors because the lab loves transcription factors. And we asked, what are, uh, what are is it that, that a number of different transcription factors, I'll show you in a slide, what is it that they do in the context of these, of, of these responses? So here's the transcription factors that we focused on. They're all kind of your favorite transcription factors if you're a CD8 T cell biologist. Although uh, I will be full disclosure, there were a few that in retrospect we should have added uh, and people always ask me. And, and I will say that the reason that we set this up was we we're actually interested in this question of uh, tumor draining lymph node versus tumor. And so these are all transcription factors that change along that trajectory. We have not yet gotten to the perturbed seek to, for, that, for that question. We did it in acute LCMV and, and kind of got uh, in, enthralled with the answer that we got there and haven't moved it forward. So the idea was uh, we would take lentivir or retroviruses that have guides for all of these different transcription factors. There are some epigenetic modifiers. We would transduce a, a pool of, of P14 CD8 T cells. These are GP33 specific CD8 T cells uh, that have been activated in vitro and expressed Cas9. We would purify out the cells that got transduced, and then we would transfer them into LCMV Armstrong infected mice. And then we would look at day seven, we'd pull these cells back out, and then we'd run 10x RNA sequencing on them. And that would allow us to both see the differentiation state of each uh, CD8 T cell that we pulled out, but also to infer uh, through, through uh, identifying which guide each cell expressed what they had been knocked out for. And so this is what it looks like in aggregate. This is all the knockout cells and all the controls together. Uh, and what you can see, and again, this was only done in acute infection. Uh, but what we saw was that it worked kind of like we would expect. You had these populations of, of progenitor cells. You could have cells that are memory precursor cells. And you had these uh, short-lived effector cells. And the majority of the cells were actually located within these different clusters. And I'll mention this other cluster, which we were a little confused by because we weren't expecting to see these cells uh, within the context of the acute infection. But this is just showing you now that we can actually make gene expression modules from these different uh, clusters, and then we can project those back onto our map, and we can see that the progenitor cells are, are like the progenitor cells in our map, the memory precursor cells are like the memory precursors, and the, and the short-lived effector cells are like the short-lived effector cells that we were expecting to see. So then there was this population that we, we really weren't expecting to see in an acute infection. And this was a second trajectory that we, that we had identified. And when we took these, the gene expression from these cells, we found that these cells now all looked like the exhausted cells that we would get out of an acute infection. So that made us quite interested in trying to understand what it was that was driving cells towards an exhausted-like fate within the context of an acute infection. 
And I'll come back to that a, a little bit later. First, I'm going to tell you that those cells, oh, I forgot about this, uh, that those cells uh, do actually express hallmark genes. So there are, uh, when you look at trajectory one, you see the upregulation of short lived effector cell genes. Uh, when you look at tra trajectory two, you do see the upregulation of a lot of genes we would associate with T cell exhaustion. Although I will point out that, that Hobbit is also up in this, in this population. And, and somebody might ask, are these exhausted or are they tissue red in memory? And I'm not going to answer that question because I don't actually know the answer. Uh, but we think they're more like exhausted, and I'm happy to talk about that answer in a, in a little bit. So in terms of what genes did what, uh, we actually, this is the way we've, we've found that's easiest to look at it. Uh, so in terms of trajectory one, we have cells that are memory precursors, or the progenitor cells, memory precursors, and short-lived effector cells. And the control cells, a majority of them are kind of balanced between these memory precursor cells and short-lived effector cells. And when we look at all of the different knockouts, and I don't expect you to see them all on this particular page, what jumps out at you is that majority of the genes that we knocked out affected where along this trajectory the, the, the cells sat. So we had, cell, we had genes like BLIMP1, which enriched for progenitor cells and we think is important for actually driving terminal differentiation. ID2 also falls into this category. We had genes that we think are important for this transition between an MPEC and an SLEC, a memory precursor and a short-lived effector cell, and that something like TBAT or, or ZEB2 or TBAT or uh, IKZF1 might be important for that. And then we had, cell, we had genes where we, when we knocked them out, we enriched for short-lived effector cells. And we think these are genes that are important for actually protecting stem mass. And Given the genes that you, you, if you're a T cell aficionado and you're looking at this, you say, yeah, so what? We kind of knew uh, that TBAT did this and, and, uh, and, and BLIMP1 did this. And it's true that the majority of the genes that we looked at were genes that gave phenotypes that we expected. Uh, and so that was very gratifying. Uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, we, were, we were not terribly excited about this data outside of that it was very confirmational in terms of what our expe expectations were. The one nice part about the perturbed seq is it does allow us to line up the effects of different genes to say that PRDM1 might act a little earlier than, say, TBET. And that, that was something that we were quite excited about. But overall, what we were able to say is there were some genes that were involved in, in protecting precursor cells and maybe restricting cells back into a progenitor state. There were some genes that are important for promoting differentiation of short-lived or memory precursor cells. And we could kind of line up where those were. So what about the, what about the genes that are important for trajectory two? Turned out that there was only one gene that, that was important here, and that was KLF2. So when we knocked out KLF2, we got a population that all fell into this exhausted-like subset. Uh, and we were able to look at this a number of different ways. The first way we did this and show that they were really exhausted like. The first way we, we, we did this was we actually made modules from all of these different uh, uh, states within, the, within, the, within this torus map that I showed. And what you can see is that the KLF2 cells uh, very strongly enrich for genes that are expressed within those, those modules associated with exhausted T cells. And they have very low expression of, of effector cell genes. We also looked at where those, the module cells show up, and they're really enriched over here for these exhausted cell uh, states. Uh, and over here, for the, even the effector cells that are present within chronic infection, they really don't, they're not enriched for that over there either. Finally, we took this, uh, this the, we also did some analysis of regulons. Uh, so, some of you might understand this better than I do. This was one of our bioinformatics collaborators who, who did this. But uh, these are the genes that are supposedly regulated by KLF2 based on, on prediction. And, and they're enriched within this, uh, this effector cell uh, cluster. Uh, but what I was really excited by was we took, a, we took a subset of genes that was defined by John Weary's lab as being different between uh, clone 13 uh, exhausted T cells and, and effector T cells in chronic infection. And what we saw was that all of these genes in the effector cells were downregulated, and all the genes in the exhausted cells were up. So we think that this really truly is not just a handful of genes, but actually these cells are differentiating to the wrong states. So could we test this a little further? Uh, and actually show this uh, in, terms of, in terms of tracking the cells. The way we did this was we used a technique that Ian Parrish's group had developed where we use a, a Cas9 that's a protein that's complex to sgRNAs. Uh, and we knocked out KLF2 in naive P14 cells or control cells. 
uh, we have control cells that are targeting no, with non-template non guides. We mix them 50-50 and then we, move, we, we put them into an LCMV and Armstrong infection. And what you can see is that when you do this, uh, now you lose the effector markers, you lose the ability of the cells to make KLRG1. They're not turning on granzyme A, which we think is one of the best markers of terminal effector cells. They're not even turning on perforin, this is an important cytolytic function for CD8 T cells. And instead, now they're turning on these exhaustion markers. They're becoming tox positive. They're upregulating CCR6, and a few of them are P2R7 positive. They're turning on this gene CD160, which we see associated with chronic infection, and they're also turning on uh, PD1. And what's interesting about this is these cells are from day eight of acute infection. And so we thought the best comparison would be look at something from a day eight chronic infection. And indeed, when you look at CD8 T cells from chronic infection at day eight, you see that they're low for KLRG1. You see they're upregulating CD160. They're expressing CXCR6. They're starting to turn on tox, and they have PD1. So these cells look like they've been in, in an infection for eight days with chronic infection. But this is a mixed experiment in, 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 in the same mouse, and the control cells don't, don't look like that. So we think this is intrinsic to the T cells and not due to the environment. We also showed that in vitro, if we stimulate T cell, the, the TCF, or sorry, the, the, the KLF knockout cells uh, in vitro, uh, we can actually get them to upregulate tox more than the control cells. So we think this is, a, again, an intrinsic response to seeing chronic antigen and, and being the role of KLF2 in potentially suppressing the, the ability of the cell to upregulate tox. And when we took the, the expression data from the CDA, from the, from the torus map, we were actually able to show that KLF2 is highly expressed over here in the effector cells. It's expressed kind of throughout the effector lineage, but it's really over here that it starts to get downregulated. You start to see downregulation after this, around this TPEX area, and you also have cells up here in the, in the exhausted lineage that are, that are downregulating KLF2. And like others, we, we have confirmed that KLF2 is, is regulated by TCR. Uh, it's degraded uh, if, you, if you stimulate T cells with, with TCR stem. Uh, Steve Jamison has actually described a number of different factors, cytokines and, um, and uh, uh, TCR signals that we think are actually that are, that, that are present in chronic infection that could actually cause the regulation of KLF2. So we think it's being downregulated within chronic infection. And that, be the, may, that may be the mechanism by which T cells are able to differentiate into exhausted cells. And I'll come back to that point a little later. So we were still interested in, 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 in what happens in the context of, a, of an acute infection because we're studying, we're more interested in memory in acute infection. And one of the questions we had was whether or not these KLF2 knockouts could actually make memory T cells, right? Uh, now, they, they look more like exhausted cells. They're not able to maintain TCF1. And this is true even if you look at the IL-7 receptor high cells, the memory the cells that we think of being memory precursor cells, even those cells can't maintain K TCF1 at a high level if you knock out KLF2. And those cells are also upregulating this marker gene of, of, of exhaustion, CD160. We also knew from the RNA-seq that the one of the, some of the genes that were, were uh, very differentially expressed are genes that we think are important for formation of memory. And that if we put these cells in culture, the KLF2 knock with, with IL-15, the KLF2 knockout cells start to die, so they don't respond to IL-15, and they don't upregulate CD127 or IL-7 receptor. So all of these things together made us think these cells are not going to be good at making memory. So what we did was we let these mice that, that had these 50-50 mixes go out long term. And the way to interpret this graph is actually that at this point here, the, the knockout cells are starting to fall behind the, 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 uh, the wild type cells. And the wild type cells are slightly enriched. And what was surprising was that when we went out to memory, it actually turned out that we were getting a large fraction of these memory T cells that actually were coming from the KLF2 knockout population, which was, which was again, a bit of a surprise. And when we look at the phenotypes of these cells, they're KLRG1 low, they're CD160 low. They, they may have a, you know, there's always a tiny shift of tox, but I would call that probably negative. They're expressing P2RX7, which is a marker of, uh, of, of memory T cells in the spleen of after LCMV infection. Uh, and also, they, they, they seem to express high levels of IL-7 receptor and low levels of CX3, CX3CR1. So they look more like memory T cells. So we again went back to literature and asked this question, what happens if you take a memory, what happens if you take a T cell out of a chronic infection and put it into a, into a, 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 a normal environment? Is it possible that you can rescue those cells and make memory? It turns out that John Weary had done this experiment uh, almost 15 years ago where they took cells out 
at day eight from a chronic infection. They put them into a, into a, 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 a LCMV immune mouse, and they showed that they would make memory T cells quite uh, capably, quite capably, but that this was fixed around day 15. So there's some transition here between day eight and day 15. Uh, they've gone on now to, this is work from Joe Gillies uh, and in John Weary's lab, they've gone on now to define this a little bit better. Uh, and they've come up with, with what I call the most complicated nomenclature ever. They have a, 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 an, a precursor exhausted cell, which is this cell that they think is re reversible uh, and, and still has not fixed its fate. Uh, and then they have an exhausted progenitor, which is present at day 15. Uh, so precursor exhausted, exhausted progenitor. Terrible nomenclature. Uh, and when you, change, when, you, when you analyze this, you see a number of differential ge expressed genes uh, in, at, the, at, at the, both the, the RNA level, but also this at the attack level, you see that there's a number of different genes that are different between these states. So they, they think these are real states. And we actually think, at least, and this is the, the hypothesis that we're pursuing, that our cells are more like this day eight exhausted pre progenitor. So they've, they've kind of opened the door to becoming exhausted, but they really need to get more signals to actually fully implement the fate. And that's not present within the context of a chronic in, uh, of an acute infection. So another paper that John Weary's lab had a couple years ago was one where they took these cells and they made memory from exhausted from cells in a, in a chronic infection, and they asked, now if we rechallenge them, do they do well? And it turns out when you rechallenge these memory cells that came out of the 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 chronic setting, these cells do very poorly. You can see the expansion of these cells is much lower than traditional memory cells. And these cells upregulate markers of tox and, and, and PD-1. They look more like they have that memory of having been in the chronic and infected environment. So we asked the same kind of question. What happens if we take our memory cells and rechallenge them? And in, in fact, when we rechallenge the memory cells that are, that are KLF2 knockout, these cells do incredibly poorly. They, they go in at 80-20 in favor of the, the, the KLF2 knockouts, and they come out about 80-20 against the, the KLF2 knockouts. So they do very poorly, and we think that's because they're differentiating again into this, uh, this exhausted-like state. They're upregulating TOX, they're turning on uh, uh, CD160, PD-1, they're not getting KLRG1, and they're upregulating CCR6. So we think that their inability to resist differentiation into the exhausted state is what's hindering their ability to be good effector cells. So summarizing what I've told you so far, uh, the main thing I want to focus on is this idea that perturbSeq has been very useful in helping us to understand how different, how different transcription factors affect trajectories to differentiation. Uh, most of the genes that we knocked out, and again, it was a very selected list, affected where along the natural trajectory of differentiation the T cell fell. There were genes that affected uh, that we think are important for restricting differentiation, those, those, my, those cells became more differentiated. We had genes that we think are important in promoting differentiation. Those, those cells became less differentiated. But when we knocked out KLF2, we got something very different. We started to get cells that we think went down towards this exhausted cell lineage. Uh, and, and, and we think that, that during natural infection, this is also how this process works, that antigen and the other signals that T cells are seeing within the context of a chronic infection are regulating KLF2, and that's part of the, the mechanism that's restraining cells and keeping them on this trajectory, uh, this normal trajectory. And what's quite interesting is unlike most of these other transcription factors, say TCF7 or LEF1, which when you knock them out, you get exhausted cells, or I mean, sorry, effector cells, those transcription factors are very heavily expressed by the memory precursor cells, whereas KLF2 is actually highest expressed in effector cells. So we actually think, and it's, it's really highly expressed throughout this effector lineage. So we actually think its role is in preventing alternative differentiation and keeping the cells on the, the appropriate trajectory of differentiation. Uh, and that when you knock it out now, they have the ability, based on the signals that they're seeing, to become uh, 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 exhausted cells within, within the spleen of an acute infection. So what's interesting about this is that there have been a number of articles over the years that have kind of tried to say these are the genes that are, these are the transcription factors that are important for this decision about whether a cell will become exhausted or an effector cell. And, and KLF2 was one that was very recently described as being important along with this other gene, FOXP1, uh, in the context of CAR T cells. They thought that KLF2 uh, is important for, for driving effector differentiation. But what's interesting about this literature is you might have thought that all of these genes would be important for restricting cells from becoming exhausted cells. But in fact, we knocked out 
all of these other genes in our screen, and only KLF2 was the only one that actually gave us exhausted cells. And that says that because, uh, I think that the, the answer here is that we did the screen in a non-bifurcated system. We did it in a system where the cell lineage should be to either become a short-lived effector cell or a memory precursor. So there was no push to go any other way. And most transcription factors only regulate how you go in this lineage. KLF2, because it restricts something very fundamentally different, you get a very different result. And we think that that's important. This is a little bit of an aficionado's point. But we think that that's actually important. This idea of doing the screen in a situation where you wouldn't get a fate is important for actually uncovering what's, in, what's necessary to get into the alternative fate. OK, so what about the implications for cancer immunology? I think the most important one that we, we've taken away from this is this idea that exhaustion is actually a suppressed state, and that staying on the effector lineage trajectory is very important for preventing cells from becoming exhausted, and, and that that can happen even in the context of an acute infection. Uh, and that KLF2, at least, uh, and maybe potentially other signals, are important for making sure that the cells stay on this, this trajectory. The other thing that we got really interested in was this paper that came out from Axel Cayley's lab, where they actually went into some detail understanding these TPEX1 cells and TPEX2 cells in the context of, a, of an acute infection, or in a chronic infection. And they had settled on this transcription factor MYB, which is when they knock it out, they lose these TPEX1 cells. But buried deep in the, their supplemental figure, they actually had shown that the TPEX1 cells express really high levels of CD62L, and that they also express, six, they also express KLF2. And then when you look at the TPEX2 cells that downregulate CD62L, they've lost KLF2. And so what we're thinking is actually it's this stage when the cells are TPEX1, 62L high cells, that they have KLF2. And in this transition to the, the TPEX2 cell, this is when they're losing KLF2. And that maintaining KLF2 may be important for keeping cells on an effector lineage trajectory to actually mediate re therapeutic responses. And so one of the things that I found very interesting about their paper is they argued very heavily that these are the cells that are responding to PD-1 therapy. And that would make sense if the, if the response is to keep cells on an effector trajectory, it would help if the cells still had KLF2 to become the KLF2 uh, ex uh, effector cells. Uh, and stay on that trajectory. So we wanted to ask this question just a little bit further, and these are just some preliminary data slides, asking this question out of, out of uh, tumor-draining lymph nodes, which is where those TPEX1 cells were. Uh, oh, I'll just mention, we think that the way this will work is that these, these 62L high cells will have KLF2 and that the 62L low cells will lose it. Uh, in this response. And so we knocked out KLF2 in, in our tumor models, and we asked what happens to the CD8 T cells in the lymph node that are, that are knocked out for KLF2. These cells start to lose TCF expression, uh, and they also downregulate CD62L. They, they lose this marker that we associate with this TPEX1 cell. I'll also mention that in this situation, in the tumor draining lymph node, these cells, and, and really it's these, these TCF1 cells, they start to upregulate markers of TRMs. So they start to upregulate CD, CD103 uh, and CD69. So we think that KLF2 may restrict more than just the decision to become an, an exhausted cell. It may actually be important for many alternative fate decisions that CD8 T cells might make. What happens if we overexpress it? And this is a very, this is like from last week, so uh, please take this with a grain of salt. But we, we made a KLF2 ER uh, that we could transduce knockout cells with. And then we put these cells within uh, the, the, the tumor bearing mouse and we gave them tamoxifen for the entire. Uh, time that the tumor was developing. Uh, and what we saw was that the knockout cells in the, in the tumor draining lymph node had lost, most of them had lost the 62L marker. But when we overexpress uh, KLF2, now we're getting a lot more of these 62L high TPEX1 cells. And it turns out that the KLF2 knockout cells don't go into the tumors very well. But when we restore KLF2, now we're getting uh, more cells in the, in the tumors. And, and so even some of these cells look like these TPEX1 cells. So we're very excited about maybe that this could help to sensitize cells to PD-1 and, and actually allow them to make better responses uh, in the context of, of tumors. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the people in, in the lab who's been doing this work. Uh, this was largely the work of a graduate student in the lab, Eric Fagerberg, uh, who's been uh, just a real wizard with, with knocking things out and really been thinking at a very high level 
Uh, yeah, he's, he's more like a, a, a postdoc at this point. Uh, he's been helped by John Atanasio, who's another graduate student in the lab, and then uh, Brian and, and Emily have helped with some of the, the peripheral stuff. And then Kelly Connolly is a very senior postdoc in the lab who did all the, the tumor draining lymph node stuff and has really been uh, very instrumental in, in helping me run the lab. And then uh, thanks to the funding uh, agencies, and I'd be happy to take any questions.